Ferry here, Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Ascot Resources Tuesday, May 30th webinar. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Ascot trades on the TSX is AOT and on the OTCQX as AOTVF and as BHQ on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange for those of you in Germany. Um, Thanks for coming. Ambest is a New York-based specialist investment management corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource sector. And please note um, this important disclaimer. This event is most definitely not a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell securities. Please read this disclaimer super carefully. Um, before we dig in, a few housekeeping uh, things I want to bring up. Ask a question of management. Just type in your questions there. It'll go straight to us. Only we see the questions, all full anonymity. Um, if you like what you're seeing now, you can create some social media posts and an email and forward that to your friends and family, uh, what have you. Um, the link that you originally were sent uh, will work for the on-demand replay about two hours after we wrap up and the processing is completed. Simple there. And then you can always go to our website, mscapital.com and make your way to the webinars and replays and you can find a copy there. So uh, you don't need to come uh, later and say, I need the replay link or anything like that. So uh, always improving. Uh, today, this is of course, Derek White, the president and CEO of Ascot and uh, also with us, David Stewart, VP Corp Dev and shareholder communications, David Stewart. So welcome uh, gentlemen. Um, why don't you kick us off, Derek, 15, 20 minutes, whatever you need to tell the story. Certainly going to be an update for a lot of people, but we want to have this fresh for new people as well. And then we'll open it up to Q&A and see where we're going. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Campbell. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I just bring your attention to the cautionary statement, uh, <clears throat> which you can read at your leisure. Next slide, please. So Ascot at a glance, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Ascot, um, Ascot is a development uh, gold company, which is uh, <clears throat> very close to bringing its mine into production. And um, the expected time frame for production is Q1 of 2024. Ascot is located right on the border of Alaska and Northwest British Columbia. And it's one of um, <clears throat> three mills which are located in an area which is quite well known in the gold mining industry called the Golden Triangle. The other two are currently owned by Newcrest and be ultimately owned by, by Newmont. Um, Ascot um, <clears throat> is probably the next uh, gold mine that will come into production in, in Canada. It's a high grade epithermal gold mine. It was um, formally uh, actually started in the 1920s and owned by the Guggenheim family. And the Guggenheim family owned it privately and, and made a fortune out of this mine between about 1920 and 1955. It was restarted as an open pit mine in, in the 1990s. And then Ascot is um, <clears throat> effectively restarting it again um, with a, a significant amount of resources, high grade gold resources as an underground hub and spoke mine. Um, Ascot um, is well positioned. It, it had financed itself uh, at the beginning of 2023 with enough capital to bring the mine into production. Um, it's, um, you know, assembling its team and, and has um, started the construction um, really in 2022 and is finishing that construction in 2023. Um, because of the well endowed infrastructure that was inherited in this deposit. And in this area, um, it's a low carbon emitter because we have a, a hydroelectric dam on the property and um, the ability to, to mine underground with pretty low carbon emissions. Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about the history um, and you know, it is fascinating. Um, you know, often they say in our business, if you're going to uh, start a mine, you wanna do it in a place where there's uh, been a mine in the past and um, as we see here, there, there was exploration and, and activity in the early 1900s. And really the Guggenheim family uh, created the premier mine, which was the largest gold mine in the British empire, including the United States. Um, and it, it operated um, pretty well between 1920 and, and 19, 
55, with the exception of the uh, Second World War, where the miners basically had to go to war. Um, and then it was started again by Westman and taken over by a nickel copper company called Belieden in the 1990s. And they decided when gold prices were low in um, the end of the 1990s to put it on care and maintenance because it wasn't part of their core business. And Ascot um, really did some exploration work from about 2010 till about 2018. Myself and some former members of the Quadra FNX team joined the company and were very interested in the infrastructure. And typically a mine like this um, with the infrastructure that it has would cost about a billion and a half dollars to build from scratch. And so the value proposition here is to get the mine restarted at a fraction of that price. Um, because the gold price is quite high and the gold grade here is quite high, um, this has the ability to generate quite a lot of cash flow once it gets in, into production. Next slide, please. Uh, to give a little bit of an understanding of, of this area, the Golden Triangle, and maybe many of you may have heard of it, but um, it's an area that's right on the border between Alaska and, and British Columbia. Um, and it uh, doesn't have a lot of, of roads or access. And so although there are geologically a lot of opportunities in the Golden Triangle, and there's approximately 80 different companies working here, mostly exploration and development companies, um, and then the two mills, the two mines that we that Newmont is about to buy from Newcrest, being the Red Chris mine, which is a copper gold mine, and then Bruce Jack, which is about 30 kilometers north of, of where we are at Premier, which is Canada's largest underground gold mine. And Ascot will be the um, the the next mill, um, uh, which will come into production in this area. We're about 20 uh, miles north of a place called Hyder, Alaska, or uh, Stewart, British Columbia. And we're blessed by the fact that we have road and port access um, so close by. Um, then we also have a community um, close by, and that allows us to deal with um, some of the infrastructure challenges that, that face the Golden Triangle, because most of it is mountainous uh, with glaciers and rivers, and, and it makes the cost of, of access for mining extremely expensive. And <laughs> really the theory that Ascot had is that we had a, enough high-grade resources to have a minimum of about 10 years of mine life with the opportunity to extend that significantly through our own exploration and from a number of junior mining companies which have high-grade deposits that surround us. Next slide, please. Um, the model that uh, um, the company has adopted um, since our kind of new team was involved in, in 2018 is to create what's called the hub and spoke model. And in the middle of this picture, you can see effectively the premier mill, um, which is where you know most of the processing takes place. And there are four initial mines which, which kind of surround that. The original premier mine that the Guggenheims um, had, and they were mining a bit farther south than where these deposits were. Um, the big Missouri mine and the silver coin mine, uh, which were, are uh, about uh, three and a half to four miles north of, of where the mill is. And then the Red Mountain mine, which is about 20 miles to the south. And the sequence really is to start in big Missouri and premier Northern Lights area and, and have at least two mining areas to feed the mill, and um, then add in silver coin and then, and then add in uh, Red Mountain in a sequence of about two and a half to three years after the mine starts up. One of the issues that face a lot of junior mining companies is they don't have enough underground development and they often run into problems. And so because these are all side hill, meaning they're portals that are put into the side of the mountain, we can access multiple mines at the same time, which gives us a lot of operating flexibility. Next slide, please. You know, since uh, we joined in, in 2018, this has been a relatively rapid development. Typically to permit and build a mine would take at least 10 years. Because we had inherited a lot of very good infrastructure, um, we effectively made a deal with Belieden to acquire it and they'd kind of abandoned it. Um, we acquired the silver coin mine and the red mountain mine and then worked towards getting an engineering feasibility study. We started to finance ourselves and we um, reenacted our permits um, to uh, with the, the permits that allow us to mine and, and um, dispose of water um, in an environmentally friendly way. And we started the construction in 20, uh, uh, 2022 and we originally had hoped to try and have the mine in production by 2023. Um, we had a couple challenges. Uh, the first one was our thickener and clarifier were on a boat coming from Asia over to um, British Columbia and we had these huge storms and the boat basically turned over and we lost our clarifier and thickener which put us back about five months. 
And the second real challenge was for us, we had a project financing. Um, that project financer had to try to change the rules a little bit on us. And we had put a lot of equity into the mine to develop it. And we were gonna draw down about 60 to $70 million in the last three months of construction. They wanted us to change the classification of our reserves, which technically wasn't possible. And so we made a decision to refinance ourselves um, which happened really at the end of 2022 and delayed effectively our tailings dam construction until the spring and summer of 2023. And the schedule now is to um, finish that construction by the end of 23 and then start production. And um, unlike most mining projects where you're more focused on the infrastructure of the mine or the infrastructure of the plant, our key um, area of what I would call critical path is the tailings dam. Now we have an existing tailings dam but we have to put it back to the standards that are required for 2023, which means we need to move a lot of dirt um, basically in the summer months of 2023 when there's no snow available and, uh, and, and, it, and we can you know, basically move and compact the, the dirt to build up the, the walls of the tailings dam. And that process is starting now and will kind of complete about the end of October. Um, and then we really start to pre-commission and commission the mill um, and we will have our two mines developed to start that process. So um, we have been started construction when we refinanced ourselves in January, and that's been going very well for us. Um, you know, we had a tough time through COVID, but we were able to get all the all the things that were necessary to, to refurbish the mine. Um, and, you know, we're excited about the fact that we've been making pretty good progress. And we really believe that, uh, you know, the, the tailwinds are really at our back right now and, and compared to 2022, um, we have a real opportunity to to complete the construction and get the mine into production. Next slide, please. And this is a slide that just shows some of the different players in Canada for for different mine uh, restarts. And you know the the two issues that really face gold developers are one timing for permitting um, all through both the U.S. and Canada. Permitting regulatory requirements are cause us a lot of issues. And the second one is just the time to and, and capital that's necessary to, um, you know, get yourself into a position where you can actually build and construct. And Ascot, um, you know, was lucky that they were able to get the permitting. Our First Nations partners are, are very helpful, the Nishka First Nations. Um, and, you know, our construction window, because this is a brownfield site, um, you know, makes it a lot easier for us to basically get that construction done. And, you know, we don't see a lot of other uh, junior mining development uh, companies probably building mines in 2024. They're probably two years out. A number of the things that you see on the slide are not uh, fully permitted or not fully financed, or they have, you know, a, a much more difficult construction window ahead of them. And so we really feel that um, this is a good opportunity for Ascot um, as it can bring itself into production and ramp itself up um, to get ahead of a little bit of some of the other players that are that are out there. Next slide, please. So for investors, why would be investing in Ascot be a, a good idea? Um, and what this is, is complicated kind of graph, but really what this is, it, it's how development companies, when they move from construction into production, re-rate against the um, JD and X in the GDXJ index. And typically it's about three and a half to four years um, that, a, that a development would happen during construction and ramp up. And you know, Ascot really hopes to do that in about 18 months. And in general, um, stocks uh, re-rate between 30 and 200 percent against the index during this period, independent of the market. And um, we we feel that you know by condensing our time frame, we offer investors the opportunity because it's a de-risking event when you're going from spending a lot of money to build to actually generating a lot of cash flow. And you know, we think that that's a really good opportunity. Generally, that as you get closer and closer to the actual production date, that that curve starts to steepen up, and really, this is you know where the, a lot of the value is is created for investors. Next slide, please. On the financing package, so we had a a, a debt package uh, for about 110 million US. Um, <clears throat> we uh, divided that into two parts. Um, a, the Sprott Royalty Group came and basically bought the debt out and um, allowed us uh, a stream. And that was coupled with a 45 uh, million Canadian um, strategic investment from Coriapu. And many people say, well, who is Coriapu? 
Coriapu is a kind of family company. Uh, they own the largest gold mine in Peru, which produces around 350,000 ounces a year. And it has a 17 gram ton of grade, um, graded per ton head grade. It's an epithermal gold mine. And they were very interested in diversifying out of Peru. They did a lot of due diligence around the world, trying to look for opportunities. And they saw Ascot as a, um, a relatively similar type of mining the requirement when they made that equity investment was that they put two people on our board and that has worked out quite well. One of them we'd worked with before in Extrata, so uh, that was quite helpful. Um, and they own around 19.9%. The stream basically is a, uh, is on all four mines. So we were able, to, they already had owned part of the, um, of the stream that we inherited on the Red Mountain project that got blended into the four uh, different mines. And basically, it's an 8.75% stream on around about 150,000 ounces of production um, spread over around 10 years. And after the 150,000 ounces, it drops down to 50% of that. And then we also have a buyback right to drop that by another 50%, so down to a quarter. We have an area to the north part of our concession, which is carved out from the royalty, which is a big silver opportunity for us. Um, and so we feel that this was a much better situation than the debt requirements. That cash was funded into our bank account in January and we recommenced the construction process about two days later. And so the financing package for us, um, especially given where the equity market is, was a strong one for, from, from our perspective. I think both the Coriapu group and the Sprott Streaming group are happy with the, the progress that we've made so far um, and continue and will continue to be supportive as we move forward. Next slide, please. These are just a few different pictures. So in a brownfield site, you know, you're really looking at, you know, I'm going to keep some things, I'm going to repair some things, and I'm going to replace some things. We'd made a pretty gutsy decision in 2020, really, you know, and, and we bought the ball mill and sag mill, and we got that installed by the end of 2022. Um, and then we basically spent a lot of our money and delivered everything that we needed to refurbish the site. Um, at, at least at the processing plant area. Um, and so now really the construction is mostly um, finishing the installation and we're really into the piping and, and system and control phase. And so the, the mill progress has been really amazing and, and we've been able to, to work that you know quite well. The, the water treatment plant, we have an existing water treatment plant um, and we'll, you know and the electrical, we have a power line that already goes into Stewart. It's a 25 kV line, but we're replacing that with 138 kV line, which will tie into the hydroelectric power plant, which is about 700 meters from the mill. Next slide, please. This is the probably the, the biggest and, and most challenging thing for us in 2023. And you can see a picture here of the Tailings Dam, which is on the left side. And um, that area that says CCDC is basically stands for the Cascade Creek Diversion Channel. And what we do is we take material from there and we, we basically blast it. We use it as a quarry site. It has to be inert, I mean, meaning no uh, contained metals. And we crush it down to a very small size and then we compact it on the walls of the tailings dam so that we can get a two to one slope. And that gives us about 12 years of, of tailings capacity done in four lifts over the life of the, of the mine. And the reason why it's difficult for us is we have to do that when there's no snow in this area and that's typically from sort of mid-May to about the end of October. And so we missed our window in 2022, and we are um, redoing that with the same contractor, Nuna, who's now on site undertaking this work. Um, once those walls are lifted to two to one, um, the mill can start to put material into the tailings dam. And so that's really an earthworks job for us. And I think we're feeling pretty confident about getting it done. Um, but that's certainly the, probably the biggest challenge and the gating item on our time frame for construction. Next slide, please. The water treatment plant, um, we've made quite a lot of progress. So we have an existing water treatment plant, um, but as part of our repermitting, you, we want to upgrade that to state-of-the-art water treatment. So, you know, for 30 years, this water treatment plant has operated without any infractions. And we're now um, increasing the, the kind of sensitivity to any kind of heavy metals or any kind of um, sediment that's in the water. In the area where you see lime silos, um, we put in the foundations for a 40 meter or 120 foot clarifier, which is quite a bit better than having settlement ponds. And then the ability to have a high density um, lime uh, filter plant and also a 
moving bed reactor for removing any residual nitrogen or, or ammonia. So we have a state-of-the-art water treatment plant, which will probably be constructed and completed by about the end of October or maybe at the end of September. So the progress on that is going pretty well. Um, and this is really important from both our First Nations and regulatory uh, partners. Next, next uh, slide, please. Um, <clears throat> on the underground development, what was really important to us uh, was making sure that we have access to multiple areas for mining. And, and for underground mining, having mining flexibility underground is critical to de-risking the project. And so we had already gone into the big Missouri area and developed that mine in 2022. And we mined the first two stopes and we found that they reconciled to what we thought was in the drilling plan and the, the block model. Um, the, the other area that we were able to really have a look at is an area called the Northern Lights. Now, originally, we were going to start to the south of the Premier structure and take 21 months to develop up to the uh, Premier Northern Lights. We were able to find an area during one of our road um, construction uh, exercises, which moved the portal to go into the Northern Lights effectively 200 meters or about 600 feet from the mill. It's a 600 meter ramp and we'll go into that area. And that's good for two reasons. One, it cuts down the haul distance to come back to the um, to the mill and two it gives us a platform to mine what we consider to be an, a new structure uh, we think we found a whole new area called the sabacway um, we'll see some slides probably a little bit later but we drilled a um, almost one ounce a ton air area there and so we want to drill that from underground and develop both the um the sabacway the northern lights and premier structure from an area closer to the mill and so that uh, construction of that ramp and developing the northern lights mine is our second mine to feed the mill will happen over the summer and fall of 2023. Next slide, please. Back in the spring of 2022, um, we wanted to go underground and test the, the block model. And so we started to develop the big Missouri um, area. You can see the, um, a lot of the construction of the mine happening here. This really happened in 2022 in the portal to the underground, which is called the S1 portal. And we're building roughly 15 feet by 15 feet portals so we can move big equipment and that allows us to uh, you know, move the tonnages that we need to support uh, the production profile at the mine. Next slide, please. These are pictures from 2022. So one of the things that Ascot has going for it is very good rock underground, and that makes a big difference to underground capital development. And we were convinced that you know the rates that we were gonna get in underground development would be around six meters uh, to seven meters a day for a single heading and around 10 to 11 meters a day for multiple headings. And that's what we found in Big Missouri. The rock quality was very good. We didn't need a lot of bolting. And we effectively got to the first two mining areas and mined them. And we wanted to see how do the grade of those first two areas, and you can see them here, which is called ore drive one and two. Those were the first stopes and we mined them uh, to make sure that the grade reconciled to what we had in the, in the, in the um, block model. Um, and that's a very good exercise for de-risking, you know, the opportunity. So th that grade and that material is sitting up on surface and it will wait for the mill to happen. But it gave us a lot more confidence in developing the mine and having certainty of the drilling, um, really estimating what the, the grades are going to be uh, as we move forward. Next slide, please. You can see some of the expiration uh, results because we've only really been and developing and working on the four mining areas, but all around these mining areas, we've had some pretty good hits. I, I mentioned the Sabakway zone that you see there, uh, seven and a half meters of 36 grams a ton. We put 15 holes into that, and we believe we have a pretty continuous structure. It's a similar structure to Northern Lights. And then really the day zone, which is an area west of the Big Missouri mine, um, both to the north and south, we, we, we continue to hit a lot of very good gold grades there and then to the west of the Premier and Northern Lights area. So, you know, what I would call near mine expansion, um, we expect to uh, continue to drill, we'll drill about uh, 20,000 meters of exploration drilling. And we'll also start to move away from the underground development because we see opportunities both to the north of Big Missouri and to the north of Sabakway to continue to find um, more material and add more life to the mine as, as we go forward. Next slide, please. So the technique that we've been using, which was a little bit different than what the old timers had in the Guggenheim's time, is we use a geophysics method called IP. And you can see it on the bottom right corner here. 
and we basically can see underground and this lights up generally um, uh, gold and pyrite uh, areas. And so we drilled this and where we drilled it, we hit, you know, really some amazing gold grades. So we've been running uh, more geophysics and we will continue to run more geophysics to the west of Sabakwe and also to the north of Sabakwe um, because we believe that it's a good way for us to identify um, other opportunities that we can drill. Now, there's no guarantee that when we get a geophysics that it means we have absolutely high-grade gold. But what we've seen so far on this uh, on this property is that there's a very high probability when we get a, a good geophysics target, if we drill it, it's going to mean high-grade um, and more resources for Ascot to develop. So it's a technique that is pretty useful to us. Um, really, in 2023, um, we can see that area to the on the on the left side, uh, to the west of um, Sabakwe that we're going to be working on, and then also to the uh, to the day zone, which is really to the uh, to the west of the Big Missouri. These both hold tremendous promise for us, and also because they're close to underground infrastructure already, it makes it a lot cheaper for us to develop that. And so these are our what I would call short-term targets to increase the mine life and increase the opportunities to have multiple mining areas right up front. Next slide, please. To talk a little bit about um, our capital structure, you know, when we look at the ownership of the company, it's pretty well divided between um, Coriapu as a 20% strategic shareholder, who, you know, really has stated their intentions that they'd like to see, you know, Ascot kind of come into their fold if we get it into production and you know put it together with their mine and become a 500 or 600,000 ounce producer. Um, institutional shareholders and we have institutions from you know really uh, Franklin Templeton and Fidelity are the two probably big ones um, and then a number of, of others Ruffer, Eric Sprott, Conway, Earth, RBC there's a number of institutional shareholders and then we have a quite strong retail group based all over the place in North America, but especially out of Calgary, Alberta. We had some um, oil and gas investors that were in Ascot before management, and they've generally been pretty supportive. Um, they've been there for a while, and they see a, a real opportunity to stick with that, and they help to you know provide some of the trading liquidity. Um, we have a number of analysts that cover us um, and are interested to see how we'll develop as Canada's next gold mine. Next slide, please. On the sustainability front, you know, we've been pretty good about getting our, our key team, the key operating team. It's a tough time in the mining world to get people, but we've been very lucky to be able to get some really great people. Um, we've been able to ensure that we have about 42% female um, as part of our, our, our overall workforce. Um, and we had about 38% of our, of, of our people being Nishka citizens, which was really helpful to us. We've had a tremendous safety record during the um, construction of zero LTIs, um, which is a pretty good and tough record to beat. Um, and so we're going to try and maintain that. COVID for us is generally pretty well over. Um, our greenhouse gas emissions uh, and what I would call environmental spills, um, you know, are generally in the lowest quartile for, for mining and at least in the gold sector. And we continue to hope to maintain that through uh, a lot of the different programs that we have working on ESG requirements. Next slide, please. You know, one of the reasons that we've been so successful here is because of our very strong partnership with the Nishka Nation. And Nishka is one of the few treaty nations in British Columbia. And in British Columbia, when you're permitting a mine, if the First Nations is not on your side, you're not going to really progress too far. And the Nishka have been fairly pro-business. Um, they've been, uh, you know, they've, they've, we've had a long relationship with them. They, they're very supportive of the mining. They, they see it as an opportunity for some of their people to, to gain employment. Um, and they've been extremely helpful in working on environmental matters and other issues for First Nations um, concerns, you know, with the regulatory governments, both in Alaska and in, and in, in, in British Columbia. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, you know, why is Ascot something that you want to look at? And I think, first of all, it's in one of the most endowed, you know, areas for gold and copper and silver in the world. And that's why Newmont is buying Newcrest, because this is an area uh, that's, that's very special in terms of its opportunities to consolidate. Um, the, the real other advantage is that, unlike many other people that want to build in the Golden Triangle, 
ASCOT already has the infrastructure in place. If we were building this from scratch, it would probably cost a billion and a half dollars, but we were lucky enough to inherit what Belieden left. Um, and really what we're doing is modernizing effectively a mine without a lot of additional land disturbance. I think that we're well advanced in our project construction and you know, in my slides putting before, we are de-risking it going from being a construction project to being a cash flow generating entity. And that's where a lot of value can take place. And we see that as pretty important for investors. This is a high grade mine, meaning it has a very good margin. It's a ASEC cost. You know, originally we're just under $800 an ounce with inflation, we're probably more of a thousand dollars an ounce, but gold has been sitting anywhere between 1950 and 2050. So the margins here are, are pretty good, which gives the mine the ability to generate quite a lot of cash flow. And then finally, because we're using hydroelectric power, we're using underground mining equipment, we don't have much of a footprint on surface. You know, from an ESG perspective, I think Ascot is 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 really um, in in the in the better uh, part of the mining industry. Um, you know, uh, from every aspect. And so, those are a lot of good reasons why we think Ascot, um, you know, uh, represents a, a, an opportunity for investors. With that, uh, Campbell, I'd uh, conclude and yeah. thank you very much. I'm happy thank to answer you. any questions. So again, uh, please send in your questions. This is the obvious place to type it in and send it. And uh, it's it's all anonymous. So just uh, Ascot team and myself uh, see it. Um, updated resource is that on track? Um, do we do we need one? Um, yeah. Well. You know, I, I think on the updated resource, we are working on it um, and we are optimizing the mine plan. Um, I think we'll probably complete that sometime by the end of the summer 2023. And we may put that out there, um, you know, probably when we finish the construction. Um, we, you know, w w uh, from a resource perspective, um, we would maybe increase uh, a, a little bit. But really, it's the classification of the resources where we have a lot of inferred resources, which are now most likely to be indicated resources and part of the mine plan because we have done a lot of infill drilling over the last two to three years. Um, how much of your work is in-house versus subcontracted, specifically engineering and, and procurement? Um, so when we um, develop these teams, we have our own in-house engineers, which you know we built and operated a lot of mines, and so we tend to try and make sure we oversee different aspects of it. We're using JDS um, Construction Group for what I would call on-site management, but we do have our own uh, overseer and construction manager of that. Um, we use Consultech as an outside engineering on the design of the of the refurbishment. But we also have our own guys um, that basically oversee them. Um, and, you know, generally for the construction part of the mine, we're using contractors. So contractors for the various trades come in to do the work. And then on the operating side, um, you know, generally we, we operate the mine. However, um, on the mining part of it, we, will, we put out to bid and tendered um, basically five mining contractors. And I don't think we're in a position, we have selected one um, and uh, that has actually turned out better than we thought. Um, and so we, we've been able to synergize with some of the other mining companies in this part of the world, but we have our own mining team, which oversees them as well. So we kind of have a mix of contractors um, and consultants and our own team. And we try to oversee or work on certain things where we can control it. Um, and eventually, I think we would try to move mostly to our, our own self-mining uh, once we have the mine up and running and we're comfortable that everything's working as we think. And um, I would just add to that briefly. Um, so specifically, uh, Chris asked about engineering and procurement. Um, engineering, based on our recent press release on the Q1 results and construction update, detailed engineering was 99% complete and procurement for the project was about 95% complete. So those are areas which uh, don't provide us a great deal of concern at the, at the moment. They're substantially complete right now. Um, you, you, very prominent is the, the hub and spoke. Right, how long before, say, Red Mountain and Big Missouri, Silver Coin, would they be integrated into uh, some uh, plan of that? Or is that already? Uh, <laughs> Well, big opinion. Missouri, big big Missouri, and um, Premier area will start up right when the mine starts. So they'll they'll be going from day yeah. one. So and our old then friend about a year, mining 
there. Yeah, Red Mountain. Yeah, and, and, and then Silvercoin will come into production about a year and a half later. And the reason for that is because we need to build a 900 meter ramp as part of the regulatory requirements. We could have gone into Silvercoin directly from outside, but the regulators want all waste and water to come to one point. So we basically are going to build a 900 meter ramp, which is gonna take us about a year and a half to get that. And then in about year three or four, uh, uh, Red Mountain would come into production. Um, and then all four areas will be feeding uh, the mill. Now that that's our plan at the moment, although we do have an opportunity to have a lot of resources around each one of these things. And so if there's enough resources in any of these mines and we feel that we have multiple development areas in one of the mines, then that will stretch out because um, it, what's really important for us is just having multiple areas to mine from. And so as these mines develop, the more number of areas will be available to us. And then around Premier and that whole complex there. Uh, there. There are other people in the area contiguous. I think Scotty comes to mind. Um, yeah, so uh, just yeah. to the north Anything you part see there of, that of, it could be good to, to, you know, targets for future mill uh, sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the thing is in this part of the world, especially around, you know, the southern part of the Golden Triangle, we have, you know, many, many, um, uh opportunities because a lot of the junior mining companies that are doing exploration may find high grade you know 15 to 20 grams a ton a lot of cases or 10 to 15 grams a ton but their deposits are relatively small they might only be a million ounces or a million and a half ounces and we see an opportunity where they're not going to build effectively a mill it's going to cost them too much money and so um anything within probably 200 kilometers that's high enough grade we could truck and process through our mill and so we do see a lot of opportunity to consolidate what I would call the southern part of the Golden Triangle. Uh, not just Scotty, there's probably five or six groups where we see a, an opportunity to create true synergy value around our infrastructure. Um, once production starts in Q1 of 2024, what will the production numbers in ounces at three, six, nine, and 12 months be? When will Ascot reach max production of gold ounces? Yeah, so um, in the first year, because we're only we're only operating for three quarters of the year and we're ramping up, we probably do something like 60 to 80,000 ounces. And then the next year, as we start to get more, we probably do about 120,000 ounces and they're pretty equal every quarter. And then we ramp up in the third year as silver coin comes in to about 150 to 160,000 ounces. And that's kind of our peak run rate is around 150 to 160,000 ounces. Although we do believe that the mill has the capacity to probably process up to 200,000 ounces a year. And if we can get enough mine development, we'll obviously shoot for that. But um, on paper, that's really the target ramp up over the three year period. Asking for some clarification, is the updated resource going or the potential to increase the mine life and or annual gold production? Yeah, the, the updated resources is more really for mine life at this point in time rather than annual production. You know, the, it's not simply having the resources, it's the development capital that we need to develop the underground mines. And, you know, I think at this point, I don't think we're ready to come out and say, yeah, we're gonna increase the production levels. Uh, we probably need about a year of operating before we can be in a position to do that. Um. Power, are you on the hydro grill uh, grid? And yeah, so it so in in British Columbia, everybody buys power from the government, and we have our own power generation uh, through an arrangement with a group called Long Lake Hydro. So they share our infrastructure, and they have a hydroelectric dam, and that hydroelectric dam is I think you can circle it on on here for people, David, at Long Lake. And that they, they run a pen stock about uh, 700 meters in elevation or say 2,100 feet down to a, a two turbines that generate 32 megawatts of power. Uh, 14 megawatts of that power goes to Bruce Jack and the rest goes into the grid. We'll take about seven to 11 megawatts of that power, but it is tied into the grid. So we can either, it's seamless, like we're really taking it from that hydroelectric plant, but um, it is part of the grid power and we are tied to the grid. And then on top of that, we have a 25 kV line that's tied into the, the, the grid in Stewart. So we actually have two power lines that come to the site. And what's, what's the approximate 
kilowatt hour cost? Six cents Canadian, so it's around five cents US per kilowatt hour. That's pretty cheap. That's what hydropower can do for you. So uh, maybe safe to say the Guggenheims were not mining with hydro, BC hydro. Uh, well, in the 1940s, <laughs> uh, they had they actually had their own little power plant that they that's how that that's how this power plant came to be. They actually had one in the 1940s, but in the 1920s they were using rail cars and horsepower at that point in time. Right, but is a game changer for the economics from say when people were looking at this in the 90s or something. You just it would have been diesel, sure. and uneconomic. Yes. So, um, very good. Uh, how how many? What's the size of the, the, the crew? Well, um, uh, the, the construction crew is about 200 people, and we have about 50 uh, uh, the kind of owner's team in various parts of, of, of being at the site and also in our office in Vancouver. And as we move into operations, it'll be around 250 people to operate the mine. Um, how long would you say before you can... We, we could say that production has been rationalized. You have an idea of cash flow and um, uh, you're, you're humming along, maybe talking about dividends and things like that. Is that a, we're talking a few yeah, years. I would but, say, you know, yeah, I would say, you know, the first year of production is always tricky because you don't know what you're going to get into. And so, you know, probably by the end of Q4 2024, we'll have a pretty good feel of how the mining is going to go. And then it's really a matter of the development of silver coin. So that's another year out. So I would say two years is probably a pretty good estimate of, you know, by the end of two years, we're going to have a pretty good understanding of where our opportunities are to maximize, you know, the production levels. And we, people might be able to, to um, uh, model this uh, a little more, more accurately. Um, very good. Um, the, the big game there um, are could you say you're you're consolidating uh, you're in a great position to consolidate uh, south of one day will be I guess it will be Newmont uh, or maybe you're setting up a package that will be attractive to to <laughs> Newmont yeah I mean I think from our perspective you know uh, when you're a single asset mining company, you start out and you're trying to get cash flow and you're getting cash flow from one source. And um, I think, you know, the two things that we would want to see is one, ultimately maybe 20 years of mine life at this mine, but putting ourselves together with another uh, operating cash flow so that we have at least two cash flow sources. That That's quite important. And maybe that will happen with Coriapu or maybe it won't. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, and I think just once we're in production and have cash flow, we don't believe that the juniors that are doing the drilling around us are probably going to move that much in terms of their market cap. So we do see an opportunity, you know, we'll have to just see how it goes once we've kind of established ourselves to consolidate a lot of resources around our infrastructure. You know, I think, you know, Newmont is a pretty big mining company, one of the largest in the world. And, you know, I'm not sure if we're big enough for their target, but there are synergy values. Uh, to having one mining camp basically for all of the Golden Triangle. And, you know, whether that makes sense, we'll just have to see. But I think initially our sites are just on trying to consolidate some of the players around us and ultimately diversify ourselves so we have at least two cash flow, my, cash flow producing sources. Um, these are this person's words. Is the current streaming deal, including the Peruvian investors, better or worse than the initial Sprott deal? So People probably think, ask that. Well, uh, would you like uh, to answer I, that I, in a so fair way? So I'm going to answer that. In, I'm going to answer that in three areas. So the cost of capital is cheaper. So that that so in other words, the streaming deal, although streaming depends ultimately on what the ultimate gold price is, it was it was a cheaper deal for us. I think on in terms of flexibility, it was also better because the problem with debt is it can work great, but if you don't do well with it, your investors get zero. And so, and I think the third thing was in terms of the construction, you know, we have all the money in the bank account now. The way the debt deal worked is we had to draw it down in $20 million increments at the very end. We put all our capital in and 
that is not necessarily the best way to construct a mine. So I think from a, a mining construction perspective, the way that the Coriapu Sprott streaming deal worked is, is significantly better um, for us. And yes, people are always worry that we give up too much upside, but because of our buyback right, which is way in the money, and the fact that we carved out a whole pile of area around Silver Hill, we think that um, we really, you know, we really probably did pretty well with that streaming deal. Uh, might you have to co go back to the market, or uh, you you're topped up for the foreseeable future with? Well, at the moment, million. no. I mean, you, you know, uh, junior mining companies have a notorious problem of always needing more capital to complete. Um, you know, we've been looking at four different ways to raise capital without having to go back to the market. So I don't think, you know, for at least the construction part of us, you know, it may be that we want to do more drilling or we want to go and take out somebody. But I think for the construction part of our piece, I'm really hopeful that we won't have to go back to the market. I'm never going to say we absolutely won't. We'll just have to see how things go in the in the fall. But at the track we're at right now, I'm, I'm hoping that that won't be the case at least for the construction of the project. I believe you said eight years, but a uh, projected mine life at this point in time? Well, internally, we're looking right now at about 10 years minimum. And um, I would say hopefully significantly more than that based on the resources that we see converting and our opportunities around us. Um, any plans for a share buyback or uh, a rollback? Um, I think that, you know, um, one of the things that uh, we would have to, I mean, right now we're just really focused on getting into production. So we're probably not going to be doing any share buybacks until we're happy we're generating lots of cash. I, I do see us ultimately, depending where we go, listing um, on one of the main boards in the United States. And th it may be that we want to consolidate our shares to get a higher share price per share. Um, it doesn't, it's not a rollback per se, but um, it may be a consolidation and that may happen if we do an M&A deal. But uh, for now, I think our focus is just using our cash to make sure we complete building the mine and getting ourselves into cash flow production. And then once we do that, we can start thinking about whether uh, a buyback or whatever makes sense. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for their great questions. Uh, at about an hour here. And um, if you have any more questions, you can go directly to the company, David Stewart, Derek White, or myself, and we'll answer it uh, in a timely way. Thanks for coming by. And um, please share your feedback. We'd love, I don't know, Ascot would love to hear uh, your uh, your thoughts and, and uh, inclinations uh, at this time. So pass it back to you. Uh, Derek and, and David, maybe uh, uh, wrap up with a uh, summary of you know, upcoming catalysts. I suppose construction start might might be a big one. Yeah, I mean, look. Uh, first of all, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this. We certainly appreciate and and feedback is more than welcome. You know, I I, I think in wrapping up, we really see ourselves as the next gold mine, and if we're able to successfully bring the construction in place. We expect there to be a re-rating and, and a number of options available to us. So the team is busy executing on that and is, is planning to you know start the production in Q1 of 2024. And we think that represents a great opportunity for people. And um, you know, and I can't say that all risks are, are reduced, uh, but we've, we've reduced a lot of the risk on this um, from where we were in 22. And if you ask me in you know, five or six months from now, that roof, and once we finish that Tanley's Dam construction, I really think we're going to be on our way. The upside potential um, from some of the expiration, you, you should always watch this space. Uh, we've, we've had consistently good results over quite a period of time. And if we add that being a producer, we think that is, is a recipe for a lot of value creation. So thank you very again for, for listening to us. Thank you. Thanks for hosting Campbell.